hard copy. It never made sense. He had all it took to be Hollywood's brightest star. Instead, Oscar winner Gig Young became one of its darkest tragedies. He could win an Oscar and go away and feel two weeks later like he was a total failure. Yet the mystery continues about the day they say he shot his new bride and himself. Exclusive, Jennifer, Gig's only daughter, talks about her father. Sometimes I hate him and sometimes I love him. Step by step, what really happened the day he died. He's gone down in history as the man who killed Martin Luther King Jr. It's just, uh, it's just too many coincidences, and there's a lot of circumstantial evidence that points in that direction. But now James Earl Ray says he didn't do it. No, I didn't shoot him. And these men say he's probably telling the truth. I think their strategy was to get me in the penitentiary and hope I would die. First round goes to Willie. William Kennedy Smith has reason to smile on the first day of his trial. The shocking stories the jury won't be able to hear. This is Hard Copy for Monday, December 2nd, 1991. Hello and welcome. I'm Barry Nolan. And I'm Terry Murphy. Good evening. Our top story tonight, long sought answers to one of Hollywood's most violent and mysterious final exits. Gig Young was a charming leading man and a newlywed when he supposedly killed himself and his new bride. Now, long hidden details shed new light on the incident as Gig's only daughter comes to terms with her father's ghost. Doug Bruckner has the story. Two women approach a palatial house on a quiet drive in Beverly Hills. This is their first time there in a quarter century and the painful memories well up. They remember the man who once ruled them there and whose voice has come back to haunt them years after his mysterious death. I was walking a tightrope. I had no idea of what was to come. So where is this part? On October 19, 1978, Academy Award-winning actor Gig Young was in his spacious New York City apartment with his beautiful bride of three weeks. It was a typical morning. Gig Young called to check the weather. His bride, Kim, called out to order groceries. Then they went into the bedroom. Gig Young shot Kim in the back of the head and then killed himself. He was born Byron Ellsworth Barr in 1921 in Minneapolis, according to the new book, Final Gig. He was a lonely child, but found a way to hide his pain when he discovered acting. Let him transfer himself into somebody else. He understands the feeling of a man that is going through this or going through that. But he did everything to take his mind off his own emptiness. During his 36-year career, Gig Young made 26 movies. He was one of the original Three Musketeers. He starred with the biggest names in Hollywood, and his career was capped with an Oscar. He was also quite the ladies' man. An affair with Betty Davis, five marriages, one to Elizabeth Montgomery of TV's Bewitched. But none of Gig Young's marriages was more disastrous than the one lived out in this house in Beverly Hills, his marriage to Elaine Whitman. It's like the old line, be careful what you wish for, you may get it. All my life I dreamt of growing up and marrying a movie star. When Gig Young married Elaine in 1965, his career had hit one of its lows. She says he was drinking heavily, deep into a depression that not even the birth of his daughter Jennifer could bring him out of. Everyone talks about Tinseltown and daughters and sons have gone through tragic things, and I have to say that I'm definitely one of them, unfortunately. Elaine says Gig Young was dangerous and abusive when he was drunk. She eventually filed for divorce, and that's when Gig Young's personal life took a dangerous downward spiral. For him, it was the ultimate rejection, and it wasn't him that I rejected, it was the alcohol. And the only way he could get even was with me was to not see Jennifer. I believe that strongly, because I believe he really cared about her. Gig went further. He filed a lawsuit claiming Jennifer was not his daughter. There's definitely some, some bitterness, but he is my father. And how can you not love a father, even though he wasn't there for me all the time? Outwardly, Gig Young seemed fine. He even made a surprise comeback with the movie They Shoot Horses, Don't They? This is old-timers night as far as I'm concerned. I'm very happy I won this Oscar because I feel with, with the nude pictures coming up, it was my last chance. But the dark side was taking over. Gig Young was in intensive therapy, and he began to tape record his tortured inner feelings. 
interesting that he could win an Oscar and go away and feel two weeks later like he was a total failure. But the biggest humiliation of all came on the set of Blazing Saddles. Gig was up for the starring role. He was visiting the set when he was stricken with an embarrassing epileptic attack. He described the scene in one of those secret tape recordings just recently released. I got as far as the camera when my head began to feel dizzy. I got on the floor, hands and knees style, and began to breathe as hard as I could. And then I finally said, okay, I'll crawl out of your way so you can shoot the shot. He collapsed two or three times, and he never said he was sick. You know, and, and they just wrote him off as drunk. And he wasn't drunk. He wasn't drunk. The part went to Gene Wilder. Gig Young felt he'd blown it. His career continued to slide. He was reduced to appearing in a kung fu film and met this woman. He was 35 years older than Kim, but soon they were married. Friends say Kim was hoping Gig would be an introduction to Hollywood fame. She soon found out that was not the case. Kim was a, um, an upward uh, mobility type person. She was a climber, and she was a bit of a user. You don't even get up to the plate. Then a day in October 1978, on a typical afternoon, something snapped. It would fit that maybe at that time when he had his tie loose around his shoulder, about to start tying it, that she told him, you don't have to tie that because uh, you're not invited. I'm going alone. She called him old gig. She just graded, belittled, and humiliated him. After 65 years of pain, Gig Young turned a 38 pistol on his wife. Then he put the gun in his mouth, and the lonely child within him was finally silenced. What happened in that apartment to drive Gig Young to such extremes? The answer remains a mystery. He didn't speak into his tape recorder that day. It was, for me and for my daughter, a dream undone because Jennifer, my daughter, lived to see her father. And we both believed that he would come around and see her. His former wife, Elaine, and daughter Jennifer still search for answers, not at the Swank apartment building in Manhattan, but in the house they shared with Gig Young. He's my father, and my God, no one can bring him back. You know, I wish I could, but I can't. So I have to go on with my life. I wonder how often so many of us have wished to have somebody else's life that seems rich and famous and have it all. And I suppose if you get that life, the pain goes with it. And the answers to that pain will stay behind that apartment door forever, I'm sure. Now, James Earl Ray, you know him as the man who killed Martin Luther King. But now he says he's innocent. This nation will rise up. No, I didn't shoot him. I didn't have any, uh, there's been allegations that I was possibly, uh, a decoy, in it, but I wasn't no decoy or did I shoot him. One on one when we come back. And later, the horror stories they won't let the jury hear at the Willie Kennedy Smith trial. A report from Palm Beach. Tomorrow on Hard Copy, the mystery of an all-American family. The Willoughby seemed perfect until mom was murdered. Then police found out about an insurance policy and dad's sex change lover. That's tomorrow. Then on Wednesday, Tony Robbins, the yuppie guru, king of infomercials. Why has his hometown paper and his family turned against him? That's Wednesday. Back with more hard copy in a moment. For 23 years, he's been known as the man who killed the dream. James Earl Ray, assassin of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. But now Ray says he didn't do it. The guy's even written a book, and he's pleaded his case exclusively to our Diane Diamond. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up, live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. What do you think when you hear those words? Well, I think all, they're all created equal, except some created more equal. That's the only difference I might agree with, disagree with him. James Earl Ray has been in jail most of his life. He's a two-bit hood who's now serving 99 years for one of the biggest crimes of the century. Memphis police report they have just confirmed that Reverend Martin Luther King has been shot. They report they were chasing a young white male in connection with the shooting incident. In early April 1968, James Earl Ray says he was in Memphis, all right, 
but on a gun running mission for a mysterious man named Raul. He admits buying a high powered rifle as part of that scheme, and he says he rented a room directly across from where Martin Luther King was staying. But when the fatal shot was fired, Ray says, he was down the street trying to get a flat tire fixed. Did you kill Dr. Martin Luther King? No, I didn't shoot him, and I didn't have any, uh, there's been the allegations that I was possibly a, a decoy, in it, but I wasn't no decoy or did I shoot him. He's had 23 years to sit in a jail cell and think back to April 4th, 1968. 23 years to gather government documents which have brought him to this shocking conclusion that a renegade group of FBI agents killed Martin Luther King and that he was just the fall guy. A war will put an end to mankind. Who killed Dr. Martin Luther King? Well, I don't know who the trigger man was. I don't think that's important. I think the important thing is who orchestrated, you know. Uh, and you say it's the FBI? Well, I didn't say it was the FBI. In general, I just said it was a small clique in there, probably one or two people. And uh, Who do you think shot him? Well, I don't know. I think I know who orchestrated it. It's documents like these that Ray uses to make his case. An FBI memo, the Bureau's campaign to, quote, remove King from the national scene. Ray has found dozens of other incriminating documents. This Deloach writes a memo to Tolson, who's the number two FBI in the case. Here's what he says. We sat with Ray for said, hours as he like read document yes. after document that he says takes the blame off him and points the finger directly at the FBI. But he weaves such a tangled quilt of intrigue and deception, it's hard to follow. And even after reading his new book, it's difficult to point to any one thing that would clear James Earl Ray and indict the FBI. It's just, uh, it's just too many coincidences, and there's a lot of circumstantial evidence that points in that direction, and there's a lot of documentary evidence that points in that direction. But you just said it, and that's the key. There's a lot of circumstantial yeah. evidence. You don't have that smoking gun. You don't have a picture of Raul. You don't yeah. have the hard facts. There's no smoking gun in this book. Well, they don't have no smoking gun against me. The shooting incident occurred at a motel where King was staying while in Memphis. Monday, King was planning to lead a massive demonstration on downtown Memphis. Arthur Murtaugh saw it all from the FBI's Atlanta Bureau. It was the headquarters of the anti-King campaign of surveillance and harassment. Murtaugh says it was a shameful time for the FBI, and it badly mishandled the King murder investigation. But a renegade group at the top planning assassinations? No way. It was, in effect, a cover-up. Uh, the, the investigation was... They went just as far as they had to to get somebody to hang it on and then stopped. This book reads like a James Bond novel. It documents in startling detail Ray's travels with the mysterious Raoul. More details than he's ever given before. Dates, names, and places that Ray says proves the existence of this mystery man. He was set up to be a patsy by the man who used the name Raoul. There is absolutely no question about that. Murray Weisberg is a former Senate investigator. He has a basement crammed with King files. He also doesn't buy Ray's story about a renegade band of FBI agents, but he does believe James Earl Ray was caught up in some sort of conspiracy. But the real problem is that we don't know who did it or who was behind it. Uh, we don't know who Raul is. Raul would be a fine lead, assuming he's still alive. I, I put it this way, I'm intellectually and morally certain that it was a conspiracy. But the decades-old question is, if there was a conspiracy, why did Ray plead guilty? He says he had no choice. There were threats against his family. His lawyer was corrupted by huge offers of money to sell his story. And finally, Ray says, it was months of prison isolation that finally wore him down. They put you in a, in a, you know, in a situation, especially in confinement, where you've got lights on all day. And they just keep wearing you down. And sooner or later, they'll, they'll, they'll have their way on it. And uh, just... Uh, are, are you telling me you were brainwashed? Well, I, I was, don't think I was brainwashed. I just maneuvered in a position where I didn't have anything to do on it. No, no other position to take. The day after his guilty plea, Ray tried to change it. And he's been working ever since to get the trial he never got. Ray says he can prove his case without a doubt, but only if the government unseals the complete Martin Luther King file. 
The House Select Committee sealed the case until the year 2020. Well, I think their strategy was to get me in the penitentiary and hope I would die or something of that nature, in solitary confinement or whatever. What it comes down to is who, who, can, who can outlive the, who, who can live the longest. If I outlive them, then I can get the records, and if, if they outlive me, then they can uh, destroy the records. <laughs> as simple as that. <laughs> Believe them or not, I think there's always a special fascination for those people that seem to have changed the course of history almost single-handedly, as, as mad as the act may have been. I wonder how much more we'll know in 29 years when that document is unsealed. Wait, I suppose. Now, the dramatic story, the jury in the William Kennedy Smith trial won't be able to hear. That's next. Tomorrow on Hard Copy, the mystery of an all-American family. The Willoughby seemed perfect until mom was murdered. Then police found out about an insurance policy and dad's sex change lover. That's tomorrow. Then on Wednesday, Tony Robbins, the yuppie guru, king of infomercials. Why has his hometown paper and his family turned against him? That's Wednesday. Back with more hard copy in a moment. William Kennedy Smith's rape trial got underway today, and everything you heard about a media circus was just a sideshow compared to this. But already, there are some stars who won't be allowed to perform. Our Diane Diamond is standing by in Palm Beach, Florida. Diane? A media circus? That's an understatement, Barry. You can see some of it behind me. You know, of all the interesting things that happened here today, uh, selecting a final jury, the opening arguments, the most interesting thing had to do with three other young women that Will Smith has known. Now, these three women were set to come here and say that Will Smith sexually attacked them as well. Now, the judge finally ruled that they will not be allowed to testify, but listen in now to the case the jury will not be able to hear. These attacks and uh, attempted rapes occurred, leases occurred in the summer of 1983 in Manhattan. It occurred in the late night or early evening hours. Lynn was attacked in the spring of 1988 in Washington, D.C. in the evening or early morning hours. Michelle was attacked in the spring of 1988, Washington, D.C. in the night or the early morning hours. She was attacked in the early morning hours of the spring 1991 in Palm Beach, Florida. All four of these girls stressed the change in personality. Lisa, he was charming. I danced with him. I felt completely comfortable with him. Once at his parents' home, one moment, moment he was standing in front of me, talking with me, saying goodnight to me, and the next minute he would, had tackled me onto the bed, apologized, seemed okay, repeated the act. Lynn, he seemed quiet, attractive, a well-dressed, very gentlemanly young man. Later, I saw a complete change in character. We were on the back side of the couch. At that point, without any warning, he grabbed, my, grabbed me by the wrist, threw me over the couch, composed afterwards, unlocked the door and let her out. Michelle, he said, no, you can stay upstairs. I just thought he was going to be a gentleman and let me sleep in his bed. Once upstairs, he was such a ferocious, almost animal-like look to him, composed the next day, very indifferent toward her. On these occasions, Your Honor, the defendant had been drinking. Every single one of these people, he got to his house by false pretenses. The defendant fostered trust in his victims. Lisa trusted him. He was a cousin of her boyfriend. No reason not to trust him. Lynn, he was a fellow medical student. No reason not to trust him, as compared to some stranger on the street that would come up and ask you out. Michelle, she attended Georgetown with him. He was acting like a big brother. No reason not to trust him. The attacks judge on all of these women were violent, sudden, and without provocation. They were pinned down and they were rough attacks. Lisa, he stepped forward, grabbed me by the shoulders, and pushed me backwards and sideways onto the bed. He stayed on top of me and tried to kiss me, and he put his hands on my breast and up my dress, put his hands inside of her underwear. Lynn, without any warning, he grabbed me by the wrist, threw me over the couch, and landed on the floor on my back pinned me to the floor with him on top of me. Michelle, he was, you know, on top of me, and I said no, and I pushed. I tried to push him away, and he had my hands so I couldn't move. Once again, Barry, those are the stories the jury is not going to be able to hear. What's next, Diane? What can we expect tomorrow? Well, tomorrow is the first big witness, and the first one on the stand, we're told, is going to be Ann Mercer. This was the alleged victim's girlfriend, who, along with her boyfriend, is said to have rescued the woman from the Kennedy estate that night. Thanks, Diane. We'll hear more from you tomorrow.
Now, mom's murder, dad's sex change lover, the mystery of an all-American family. More in a moment. At first, she seemed to be a victim of a murderous burglar. I not only lost my only daughter, but my closest friend. Trisha Willoughby seemed to have it all. A happy marriage, three loving kids, a successful businesswoman. But when she was murdered on a family vacation, police found some family secrets. Now her husband's sex change lover is the prime suspect and is on the run. The mystery of an all-American family, tomorrow on Hard Copy. That's it for tonight. Thanks for joining us. I'm Terry Murphy. And I'm Barry Nolan. Good night. I have a permit to sell them on the street, but I haven't done it. I'm looking to hire someone. But if any working press come down to the store and it's my shirt, I'll give you a good price, $10. How'd you come up with this idea? Wouldn't you just run a t-shirt business? Anymore? No, I don't. A friend of mine came out with the first one, the Obaro Kennedy O t-shirt. And he was making them as a joke and giving them to friends. And I met him and said, gee, I could carry those in the store. And so we've been selling grosses of those. That's the most popular shirt.